morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, everybody, to our webinar today on challenges of EML online learning during the COVID-19 pandemic, September 19, 2020, with me, Pastor Kalisa, as the moderator, hostess to our webinar. We proudly present this webinar organized by Central Java Tevlin in collaboration with the British Council Indonesia. And for your information, this webinar is attended around 2,500 participants from all over Indonesia, from Java, Sulawesi, Maluku, Borneo, and many more. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know that the rapid spread of COVID-19 has forced the educators to survive in time of crisis. The sudden shift from face-to-face -face learning to distance learning also exposes more efforts for teachers. In addition to this, the access barriers to the internet and the lack of ICD skills are becoming other challenges in Indonesia's distance learning initiative. Realizing these challenges, Central Java Tevlin, in collaboration with British Council Indonesia, bring this topic to promote English teachers' awareness uh, in the challenges in online teaching during the COVID-19 pandemic and how these teachers can cope with the challenges. Before we proceed, let me inform you the housekeeping rules. As British Council will record the whole webinar session, so by attending this session, you acknowledge that your image and comments may be recorded and rebroadcast. For those wishing to give question, please type your question in the chat box on YouTube by mentioning your name, organization, and the city first, and then write to whom your question is addressed. Later, the moderator will summarize and deliver the questions to the speakers. And after the session ends, you will be redirected the questionnaire and please spend your time to give your feedback later. Make sure you complete the questionnaire to be recorded in the presence list. And the link to download a certificate, attendance list and materials will be provided after you submit your feedback. Well, ladies and gentlemen, today we already have five distinguished speakers joining in front of us. Ibu Isi Yuliasri from Universitas Negeri Semarang, the Central Java Tevlin Coordinator, Welcome, Ibu. Bapak Gumawang Jati, the president of ITEL, Indonesia Technology Enhanced Language Learning Association. Welcome, Bapak Jati. And the next is Ibu Finita Dewi from Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. Welcome, Ibu. And the next speaker is Mr. Calm Downs, director of English, Education and Society, British Council, Indonesia. Welcome, Calm. And the last is Mr. Aslam Khan, the Executive Vice Chairman of Arican Education Group and also a Council Member of NAPE, National Association of Private Education Institution, Malaysia. Thank you very much for coming to the webinar today during the heartbreaking pandemic. I also would like to thank all participants of this webinar for attending on YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, to start, we're going to have the first speaker, Professor Isi Yuliasri from Universitas Negeri Semarang. And we will start with her to talk about the baby boomers' perception of online English teaching during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we will move on to the other speakers lined up for today. So ladies Langsung and gentlemen, ngomong. let us welcome ngomong Professor ngomong. Isi. Hmm? Ngomong aja. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pasakalisa, the moderator. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, on behalf of Central Java Tevlin, I'd like to thank the British Council for the great collaboration we are having today for the webinar. And my special thanks go to Dr. Com Downs, the Director of English Education and Society, and also the British Council team, and we really hope that this collaboration will go on in the near future time. I would like also to thank all the speakers today, Dr. Aslam Khan from Malaysia, 
uh, Dr. Gumawang Jati from ITB, Dr. Finita Dewi from UPI, and also, of course, uh, the collaborator from the British Council, Dr. Downs. Well, before the other speakers talk about the essential issues related to the challenges of online English teaching during the COVID-19 pandemics, and how to cope with them, I will start today's session by presenting the findings of my informal survey to the baby boomers or boomer generation. The survey was intended to find out about their perceptions and opinions based on their experience on the online English teaching during the pandemic. Before I answer, before I answer the question why I did the survey to this age group, let's see who the baby boomers are. The baby boomers are those born between the year 40, uh, 1946 and 1964 or uh, the age of 56 and 74 years old now. Other generations are the Gen X, the, G the Generation Y or the Millennials, and also the Generation Z. Although the known division uh, of generation gives us four generations, and in everyday life in Indonesia, the public usually only know two major categories, like the old generation and the millennials. And jokingly, in Indonesia, uh, when we talk about the old generation, they sometimes jokingly say that the old generation is the colonial gener generation, as opposed to the millennial generation. Now. Let's see the general characteristic of baby boomers. I quoted this from Papas 2016. It is said that baby boomers are said to have strong work ethics. They have also they are also self-assured, competitive, goal-centric, resourceful, mentally focused, and disciplined. However, Despite these good qualities, it is also generally agreed that the baby boomer generation is less competent with IT literacy compared to the younger generations. Of course, I'm not talking about the uh, exceptional baby boomers like Dr. Gumawang Jati and Dr. Aslam Khan, our speakers today, but I'm talking about the mainstream or the general of baby boomers. Well, uh, let's see uh, my, sur my survey. What about baby boomer English teachers in Indonesia? From my observation with the teacher in service training programs like PLPG and PPG that we have every year, uh, English teachers of the generation are commonly less ICT literate than the younger ones. And actually, when I reflect to my myself, I'm also not quite ICT literate, and I'm very slow in dealing with new technology and new application. So on one side, these teachers are not quite competent with ICT, and on the other side, the students they teach are highly ICT literate because they are mostly of the Generation Z or the digital natives. That is why it is very interesting to know how they can cope with the online teaching challenges during the pandemic. So with this curiosity, I conducted this survey. The survey involved 81 respondents, mostly from Central Java, but there are also some others from other parts of Indonesia. 
their English teachers from primary school level to university level, both male and female, and age ranged between 56 and 72. And they come from cities, from small towns, and from rural areas. Now, let's see, with regard to ICT usage for teaching, the survey allowed the respondents to indicate more than one kind of ICT. And it is revealed that the respondents' favorite ICT for online teaching is WhatsApp. So uh, it's about 78% before the pandemic or before, before the work from home and 85% uh, during the pandemic. So there was an increase. And these followed by the use of email and Google Classroom. YouTube was also among the top three ICT in use before the pandemic. But then after the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic, uh, Zoom overtakes it. Uh, so Zoom is more popular than YouTube now. As to the difficulties of uh, online teaching, about 49% admitted the existing difficulties. And the problem were caused by signal problems, uh, time management, and technicalities. As to the effectiveness of uh, online teaching, uh, I should sadly say that only about 30% of respondents consider it effective. Uh, so the rest think that it is not so effective or not effective at all. Uh, and then about the coverage of teaching materials, similar with the effectiveness of teaching online, uh, they say that uh, only 30% only of them said that uh, the materials are well covered. The rest think that uh, they are not well covered. So in response to the question of their feelings about online teaching or working from home, only about 29% were happy. The majority feel that there is nothing special or just ordinary feeling. And the rest, 27% said that they feel bored. The most interesting finding is that uh, during the uh, before the pandemic, more than 70% respondents seldom and never use online teaching. But then when asked their plan after the pandemic, whether they will continue using online teaching or not, around 90% respondents plan to go on with blended learning. So this shows the significant increase of awareness of the usefulness of ICT in teaching. Now, uh, when asked why they are in favor of online or face-to-face -face teaching, so here are the responses. With online teaching, it's efficient, suitable for students who are millennials or digital natives, and it's good for a variety of teaching modes or multimodality. And it's also good when teachers need to be away on other duties. It also allows rich resources. But they still value face-to-face -face teaching for some reasons, like emotional bond, character building, and also for instilling of good moral values, for human touch, for modeling of good attitudes, and for jokes. So, in conclusion, despite the challenges encountered, the baby boomer teachers under survey have become more aware of the usefulness of online teaching in combination with face-to-face -face one. They also believe that there are things in education that are better done via face-to-face -face meeting, like for building characters, for instilling good moral values, and for emotional bonding, etc. So here I would like to highlight that two things that people are not satisfied with uh, online teaching is that they think that the materials are not well covered and the teachings is not quite effective. 
So these are the challenges for the baby boomers uh, to solve for the uh, for this semester uh, and on with their teaching. So I think uh, with that in mind, I would expect that the next speakers would give us some enlightenment uh, to all the teachers, the English teachers, and particularly to the baby boomers on how to deal with online teaching more efficiently, more effectively, and to cover all the and to cover all the materials they intended to deliver to the students. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I guess that's all from me today. And I really hope that the next speakers will answer the challenges of the baby boomers and also all the other teachers uh, of English in Indonesia. Thank you very much. And I'll give it back to the moderator. Thank you so much, Ibu Isi. It's really nice to hear the teacher's perception on online teaching from the point of view of old generation. So uh, for your information, I'm not in that generation. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, for those who just came, I'd like to say welcome to our webinar today. And for questions, you could leave them on the chat box on YouTube by mentioning your name, organization, and the city first, and then to whom your question is addressed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to move on to the next speakers, Bapak Gumawang Jati and Ibu Finita Dewi in one session. They're going to talk about uh, the emergency remote teaching in EFL context. Bapak Jati and Ibu Finita, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Ibu uh, Pasca. Morning, everyone. How are you today? Hope you're in uh, good health. Um, let me continue the presentation. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about more on ART, Emergency Remote Teaching. Let me share you um, my screen. So, um, Emergency Remote Teaching in the FL context, uh, I'm going to talk more, or we are going to talk more on about the Indonesian context on this. Um, so, bear with us for about 30 minutes. Then, if you have any questions, just type it in the text box in YouTube and we're going to answer that later on at the end of the presentation. This is the um, two-page menu that we are going to cover in 30 minutes. It's about emergency remote teaching. So what is happening in Indonesia? And then uh, voices from the teachers that we gather through uh, formally and informally. Then um, <clears throat> things to keep in mind. And then uh, Finita will uh, close with the six top uh, technology tools that might help for the uh, remote teaching. So uh, online learning and emergency remote teaching, there are two different things that people sometimes forget. They treat emergency remote teaching as online learning, of course, then emergency remote teaching through online. But there are two things that uh, we have to consider. They are not the same. Yeah. Um, online learning, it's more on design purposely. So the design is there. Um, that's for the remote and distant. So it's designed by, by a designer or together with the teacher in the curriculum and so on and so on. And also it's a main mode of uh, the education. It's accessible and voluntary, meaning all of the materials are there, well prepared, uh, design nicely, neatly, and voluntarily. If the students want to access the material, they can. If they cannot access, well, that's okay. Yeah, it's a full long-term solution. And it's not urgent. So if we don't have the online today, that's okay. It's, it's, it's not urgent. If not, not ready with today or next week, we can prepare it for next month and so on and so on. Yeah. And they have the um, resources are all accessible and full faculty support. So everyone think about it, everyone make comment about it, everyone put a thought in that. Yeah. The most important here is the children are voluntarily uh, enlisting. If they have the access, then they might want to study or to get the material. Or if uh, they are busy, then they do it uh, next week. You know, so synchronous and unsynchronous, 
So the students are ready with the mode of online. They know that I need to spare time with this. I have to concentrate and so on and so on and so on. Yeah. So that's um, online learning. So uh, how about uh, remote emergency remote teaching? Let's have a look at that. Um, activate and respond to a crisis beyond the uh, human control. And it's for temporarily, meaning uh, it's not for long term. Uh, may lack of resources because it's an emergency. I don't have this. Uh, don't have the uh, students. Don't have the access uh, uh, in a very remote area. The material are not ready, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and may have not full support from the faculty. Uh, and the student don't have any choice. They don't have any choice at all, and um, they have to accept what it is. So the readiness of the student is not there. Readiness of the teacher is not there. Readiness of the material is not there. That's for um, emergency remote teaching. Yeah. Everything is through online, but there are two different um, uh, preparation uh, access and so on. Yeah. Now, um, let's uh, have a look at the voices from the teachers during the uh, emergency remote teaching. Um, I use my Twitter, I use my Facebook, I use my social media to get the voices. I also ask uh, participants uh, in a big webinar, several big webinar um, questions about uh, the voices. So, three favorite technology tools for teaching. You can see here, Zoom, Google Classroom, WhatsApp, and Kahoot. So that's a uh, favorite. Then you, we can see here, Zoom, of course, that's for um, teachers and students who live in a good access area. And then they mentioned here is WhatsApp. Here must be uh, in the rural area, Google Classroom. Yeah, Kahoot is fun and so on. So this is uh, used for replacing somehow face-to-face -face, uh, meetings using Zoom. Yeah, because that's the easiest way on that. Yeah. Okay, so that's the uh, favorite technology tools. Now let's have a look at the um, online situation. Three words. What I like here is said menantang, happy, bingung, lelah. The word menantang indicates that's a positive. I got a challenge. It's emergency. I have to do something. So there is an urgent, uh, there is a courage that the teacher in a positive attitude, they want to learn more. That's why a lot of webinars, um, they get help maybe from their peers to get uh, to solve the uh, problems and they face in um, emergency remote teaching. Yeah, some got bingung, that's fine, and happy. Yeah, and capek. Of course, it's uh, tiring with the online for uh, more than three hours a day. Yeah, but this is the uh, description of online teaching situation. Interesting. Menantang meaning that the teachers want to learn something and they are being challenged to solve the uh, situation. Now, common problems. So I conclude that mostly the problem is on the uh, interaction. Yeah. Crowd sourcing that I did through uh, Facebook, this is for, for example, one of uh, the crowd sourcing that I did. Yang dibutuhkan dosen untuk PJJ itu laptop, HP, kuota internet, kemampuan membuat materi ajar online, kemampuan membuat video kuliah, kuis online, hmm, apalagi ya. And most of the rest uh, people said that they got problem of the how to interact, how to engage the student, and how to motivate students to be autonomous learner. Yeah, so those those three area. Uh, I think that's a good area later on if you're interested in doing a research 
about online learning is on this area motivation engagement and interaction yeah uh, that will be uh, interesting on that now um five things to keep in mind during ERT yeah and advice from uh, me it's adopted by uh, Krishna uh, 2020 um this one compete with the mass distraction so the teacher should be focused small bites and give immediate feedback because they have to compete with Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, with a group, a messenger, and all of those distractions. And games, of course. Students, if they are not focused, yeah, they get bored listening to me uh, for five minutes, and then because um, I'm talking here and they're not really focused, then they might check their messenger at the same time, or they might chat with their friend and what's up as a back channeling and so on and so on. So focus, bite side, immediate feedback. That's the key. Yeah. Number two, stick to the essential. Meaning uh, limit the new stuff. It's very different with face-to-face -face giving lecture. Review the old stuff. Tell students where they are going. Yeah. That's very important. And then you have to design the activities one at a time from simple to complex. I'm going to give you an example here, but I will not show it to you. You can uh, later on uh, click when I share this slide. Yeah. Here, for example, using the uh, uh, discussion board, then um, you can ask the question in the discussion board. For example, uh, if I say the word mammal, mammals, what's come in your mind? And then they write it in the board here, and then the interaction between students and students, and I can give comment and so on and so on. So the, the trigger there is uh, just questions. Or I can put a picture in the wall, then they will uh, respond to the picture. Or I can have the audio, a report about mammals and then they respond to that and then I at the end I can give a video so this is just an example of from simple to complex tasks involving everyone in the class using a digital board so I start with the simple questions and then pictures and then the audio and then video not straight to the video or not straight to the can you write something about you know so you have to slice that lesson in bit in a bite size yeah uh, if you're interested to have a look at the sample later on you can click this link and then um will take you to the uh, digital board yeah okay enough for part two uh, then i give it to finita fin time is yours fin thank you pak uh, i'm gonna share my my own screen can you stop uh, sharing your screen, Pak? Sure. Okay. Okay, hopefully my screen is uh, displayed right now. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to continue Pajati's explanation on, uh, wait. Uh, I need to make sure that my screen is on. Can you see my screen, Pajati? Um. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's just displayed on YouTube. All right. Uh, let me continue your explanation. Uh, previously, Pajati has explained um, what happened in our country during the emergency remote teaching, uh, what kind of things that the teachers feels and uh, what technology that they use during the emergency remote teaching and also Pak Jati have has mentioned the first two uh, tips uh, things that we need to keep in mind uh, when we as teachers doing the emergency remote teaching 
not on the groups. What we need to keep in mind is um, spreading learning and practices into bite-sized learning. What does it mean? Uh, for example, we usually, teachers usually uh, shift the learning activities from face-to-face, -face, so from face-to-face from -face mode directly into the online mode. So for example, you have like 60 minutes of teaching. Uh, some teachers do a 60 minutes of Zoom meeting. And uh, this is not really healthy actually for students and also for teachers. They have to uh, stare at the screen for uh, that very long time. So our tips is that uh, it's better for us to spread the learning into small bites of activities. So for example, you can have uh, 15 minutes activities for brainstorming, for uh, discussion, and another 15 minutes for practice, another 15 minutes for uh, another main practice, and then also for uh, ending like productive, uh, productive work, they can do it in 15 minutes. It's better for the students to have uh, small bites of activities rather than getting a burst of one activity within 60 minutes. It also can reduce the boredom, uh, the anxiety of the students and also the teachers. We also need to lower down our expectation during this kind of uh, activities by, um, what is it, staging the activities from the simplest to the most difficult activity. So we need to keep in mind that uh, by chunking the activities would be helpful for our students. Once I heard uh, a parent uh, talk about uh, his son's teachers who is very good in managing the activities. So he only uh, did a 15 minute Zoom meeting and after that let the students work on something for like uh, 30 minutes or an hour and get back to Zoom for another 15 minutes for wrap up rather than doing it uh, at the same time. So probably we need to think about that. The next one is uh, using relevant uh, prior knowledge. We also need to help our students to get into the topic that we are discussing, to get into the learning process by uh, dragging their um, prior knowledge into the, the learning process uh, at hand. Because by, by helping them with the prior knowledge, for example, prompting them with pictures, prompting them with videos, it will uh, help the students to get engaged and uh, to get tuned in to the learning process. If it is a totally new stuff, uh, it's going to be difficult for them to get engaged. And when the engage, uh, we lost the engagement with the students, then we lost the, the students' motivation. It's difficult for us to maintain the students' motivation. The next one, this is the last tips. It's giving support and guidance during practices. If, for example, you are using asynchronous communication, you are using Google Classroom, for example, Ibu Isi previously mentioned that one of uh, the tools uh, being used by many teachers are Google Classroom or WhatsApp. We need to keep in mind that uh, we need to provide direction, interaction, uh, instruction, which is clear and well structured so that students know where they are going. We cannot just give uh, one sentence instruction like uh, do this or do that without giving them the stages of uh, activities. It's better for us to provide them with the well structured activities. Students know where they are going, students know uh, the teacher's expectation, and they also need some kind of model, some kind of expect answers some kind of expected uh, outcome or product uh, from the teachers so that they can visualize they can figure out what the teachers want uh, giving prom and then uh, giving uh, the stages of activities we also need to reduce the degrees of freedom so first uh, we can start with control practice and then um, Little by little, we can provide uh, a more uh, a freer activities, uh, things like that. All right, so those are the five uh, things or four, five tips that we need to keep in mind. We are doing the emergency remote teaching for uh, with our students. Now, my last slides would be about uh, six top techno 
technology tools from Pajati and I actually. Um, uh, when you see this technology tools on the screen, uh, all the audience in uh, YouTube, you might mention which tools that you are familiar with or which tools that you have ever used during this emergency remote teaching. Uh, in this very short time, uh, it is impossible for me to demonstrate or to, to show you how to use it. But then later when you get the chance to access our uh, slides, you can check uh, the plus button, the, uh, the plus button will uh, direct you to the website and the play button here will direct you to the uh, tutorial video so you can learn it by yourself later. I'm going to just, uh, I'm just going to explain briefly about how we can use this six tech tool for online learning or emergency remote learning. I've seen some of you mention uh, Padlet. You you know Padlet. What about the others? Do you know some of these tools? Uh, displayed on the screen. All right. I'm going to start with Screencastify. If you uh, would like to give a kind of lecture or explanation, uh, video instruction, things like that, probably you need to record your uh, video. I've seen some uh, teachers creating extraordinary video on YouTube. And I believe because it, uh, it use um, a kind of uh, tools which are pretty complicated. It takes time for you to create your video. Probably for a 10 minutes video, 15 minutes video, you need to create it for two or three days where you don't have much time. So using Screencastify, you can create a five minutes video with one click away, as long as you are ready with your PowerPoint or with your uh, with anything that you would like to present. And then with another one click away, you can post it in YouTube. So only two clicks away to create and to publish on YouTube. Sounds very easy. You need to try it. Um, you, you don't need to edit things. Uh, maybe you need to take uh, one, uh, for the first time, you need to take once or two times. But once you are familiar with the tools, once you are uh, pretty confident with the screen, you can do it easily. Um, the next one is Genially. Genially is the tools that I usually use to replace PowerPoint. Why? Because Genially has a more attractive visual uh, display rather than PowerPoint. If we don't have any, um, what is it, talent in uh, graphic design, just use Genially and then you can have a very interact, uh, attractive uh, power, uh, display like PowerPoint. You can also create some games, some um, um, interesting interactive activities using Genially. So what you need to do later, just click the plus button to go to Genially or click the play button to uh, learn how to create things with Genially. Number three is learning apps. If you are living in a place where uh, um, internet is not really good or your students didn't have a good internet connection, you can try using learning apps for providing some Control practice, something like multiple choice exercise, matching exercise, uh, gap filling exercise, or even a kind of a board for students to write together, similar, uh, similar to Padlet. Um, there are so many activities that you can find in learning apps, template of activities. You can see uh, other people's activities which has been created and just recreate uh, their exercise and adjust it with your own content. It will be very easy. Explore it, explore learning apps, and you can create so many uh, interesting activities. Oh, by the way, all the, all the tools that I'm introducing today are free, okay? So yeah, some are with limitation, but some are uh, totally free. The next one is Padlet. Uh, I think Padlet is pretty popular among teachers right now. I know uh, the free version is only provide us with uh, five uh, Padlet, but it's okay. 
in Padlet, you can use uh, Padlet to display students' product. Uh, students can comment each other. Students can have a collaborative writing in Padlet. Uh, students can post pictures, videos, links, and so on. So it's like a huge virtual uh, blackboard where everyone can post any types of media, not only text, video, audio, and many other things. The last two, uh, I'm going to introduce you to Flipgrid, one of my favorite two. Um, if you're teaching English and you want your students to practice uh, speaking, if you want your students to uh, present something, you can use Flipgrid. Why? Because in Flipgrid, they can just uh, record a one minute video explaining something and uh, they don't need to make any video editing, which is unimportant for language learners. Uh, don't exhaust your students by asking them to edit video. It takes time, but it doesn't improve their uh, language skills. In Flipgrid, uh, other students can comment to a student's video using another video. The teachers also can give feedback using video. So everyone can voice uh, express uh, their voice in Flipgrid. The last one is Edpuzzle. Uh, once I heard a colleague uh, mention that uh, if I create a five minutes video and it takes me like two days to, uh, it took me like two days to create my video, I'm not sure that my students will watch it. Would that be a waste of time? Well, if you're using Edpuzzle, it won't be a waste of time because you're, if you insert your five minutes video into Edpuzzle, you can make sure that your students watch your video. Because, for example, in five minutes video, at the first minute, you want to ask questions. Students will have to answer the questions before they can, uh, they can continue watching the video. So they cannot watch the whole video unless they answer questions from the teachers. Uh, it's a bit distracting sometimes, um, but we can also make sure that students watch the whole videos. Uh, we can track the students' answers and also give feedback to them while they are watching the video. So we give different kind of sensation, different kind of experience in watching video lecture by using Edpuzzle. And if you are using Google Classroom, uh, Flipgrid Edpuzzle can be married, can be embedded easily uh, using Google Classroom. So the score that you provide in Flipgrid and Edpuzzle can be seen directly in Google Classroom. So that's the six tech tools from um, Pajati and I. These are the six tech tools that we uh, frequently use and we find that it's pretty useful for teachers. Uh, it, it doesn't require too high bandwidth. Probably the highest bandwidth would be in Flipgrid because it, uh, it's a video uh, application, but the other are pretty low bandwidth. The lowest bandwidth is this one, learning apps. Uh, to close my presentation, to wrap up, uh, these are the six things that we need to keep in mind. Keep our online uh, learning short and simple. We need to prepare it well, of course, just like our face-to-face -face, uh, teaching, we need to prepare it to provide the structured instruction, structured activities, help the students by preparing them with their uh, background knowledge, give short, tiny, little assignments which are not too burdening uh, and keep the excitement, enjoyment of the students. And the last one, we can also make use of available online resources. We don't need to create our own all by ourselves. So that's all my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, you can take a picture of this uh, last slide because you can get access to our slide here. Thank you. And I'll give it back to the moderator. All right. Thank you so much, Bapak Jati and Ibu Finita in Spain and really enlightening for those coming to this webinar today, I'm sure. So frankly speaking, I'm familiar with some of them, but for the rest, I've even uh, never heard about it. So yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to our webinar today. Let me inform you some housekeeping rules. 
as British councils will record the whole webinar session. So by attending this session, you acknowledge that your image and comments may be recorded and uh, rebroadcast. For those wishing to give questions, please type your, your question in the chat box on YouTube by mentioning your name, organization, and the city first, and then don't forget to write to whom your question is addressed. Later, the moderator will summarize and deliver the questions to the speakers in the question and answer sessions. So after the session ends, you will be redirected to the questionnaire. Please spend your time to give your feedback. So make sure you complete the questionnaire to be recorded in the presence list. And the link to download a certificate, attendance list and the materials will be provided after you submit your feedback. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move on to the next speaker. In this session, I'd like to invite Mr. Com Downs. And so without further ado, please welcome Mr. Com. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, Salamat pagi, uh, everybody. Um, my name is Colm Downs, and I'm the Director for English Education and Society at the British Council Indonesia. I just wanted to begin by thanking Central Java uh, Teflin uh, for organizing this webinar. Um, I'm, a, I'm living in Java myself in Jakarta, not in Central Java, but Central Java is one of my favorite places in Indonesia. So I wish you all well, and I hope you're enjoying your breakfast during this webinar this morning. Um, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for their time, for, for joining us for this webinar today, and for really for all of you, whether you're in central Java or anywhere else in Indonesia, or maybe even outside Indonesia, thank you for joining us. And also special thanks for all of your efforts during these very, very difficult, challenging times. It's a very hard time to be a teacher and a learner. I know that you are desperate to teach and your students are desperate to learn. And your efforts over the last couple of months have been extraordinary in learning these new tools and techniques in order to remain engaged with your learners. My session today, I'm going to talk a little bit about assessment. Um, I'm going to talk about the general principles of assessment um, to begin with. And then also I will talk a little bit about assessment um, remotely, whether it's synchronous assessment um, during synchronous online learning sessions, such as this webinar, or whether it's through the use of asynchronous tools. At the end of my talk, I'm going to share some tips and resources so that you can go away and learn more about these things in your own time. Um, but to begin with, I think it's worth spending a few minutes just reflecting on the situation um, that many teachers are facing around the world, including here in Indonesia. So I'm going to share some slides and some photos with you and uh, we can reflect together. So let me try to share my screen. Okay. Just, I want to show you two photographs, which I think really demonstrate the situation here in Indonesia. And keep these images in mind when you think about how you are teaching and how your learners are learning and how you are going to assess their learning um, you know, during these extraordinary times. So here's a, a photograph that I saw in an article in the New York Times about two weeks ago. It's actually taken from a, a place in central Java. And in this photograph, you can see, I mean, these are students that have walked up uh, from their village or you know, to a, a higher point um, so that they can get a good internet reception so that they can download materials from their teacher or so that they can connect to a synchronous online session. So we can see through this photograph just how challenging it is um, to remain connected, but also how determined students are to keep learning. In this second photograph here, um, what I find interesting about this picture is there is no laptop there is no, there are no mobile phones. Um, this is in a, a, another remote location where the internet is not strong enough. So here you can see the teacher in the back of the photograph. 
this teacher is visiting students at home uh, and perhaps is only able to visit them once a week in order to deliver a short lesson or maybe to give them some tasks to do before she comes back um, for her next visit later on. So I, I think these are, are worth keeping in mind, the situation. If I show you the next slide, this uh, illustrates what is called the digital divide. Um, Indonesia is not alone. There are many, many countries around the world where not everybody in the population has uh, good access to the internet. So whilst we will talk about the use of online tools, both high-tech and low-tech, it's also worth bearing in mind that some students and some teachers still struggle to have access to the internet at all, or maybe don't have the tools um, that are needed to use. You know. Moving on, I'm going to highlight uh, the results of an initial survey that the British Council did with English language teachers around the world. This first survey was conducted between April and May um, earlier this year, you know, during the sort of the beginning of the pandemic to find out what were the um, experiences of teachers and also what were their, their sort of training and teaching needs during the pandemic. This question I wanted to focus on, the fourth question, what are the challenges? Um, I'm sure as you look through this list, you might recognize some of those and share those challenges yourself. But quite high up uh, on that list, and one that many teachers have, have spoken to me about, is how do I assess my learners? How do I monitor their progress? Um, it's, just, you know, it's, it's very important that we do this in the classroom and even harder to do this remotely. So this is really what I'm gonna be focusing on in my talk. I'd like to start with some fundamentals um, and some general observations about assessment in English language teaching. One thing that I would say is that simply more training is needed. Um, I don't think it's useful to say that some teachers are experts at assessment and know everything, and then maybe that's their specialism, and other teachers know nothing at all and just deliver tests in the classroom. I think it is a scale um, of learning, um, but I think that it is very clear that um, most teachers need to learn more about assessment and would benefit from more training to feel more confident about assessing the, the, the progress of their students in class. In initial teacher training programs <clears throat> uh, that are run, not enough time is usually given to assessment um, and the importance of assessment in the classroom. Also, I would say that um, there have been over the years, quite a lot of developments in assessment, including the use of technology and AI to assess learners. And so perhaps if you did your initial teacher training um, a long time ago, if you learned to become a teacher um, 10 or 20 years ago, perhaps, um, maybe you haven't had the opportunity to, to retrain or to become updated on some of the new approaches and techniques. So I think it's really important to recognize your own knowledge and skills and experience and continue learning. And it's not just about uh, good pedagogy in the classroom, good teaching practice, but it's also about assessment. So some core kind of um, areas of assessment that I hope you're familiar with, and if you're not, that I encourage you to look more into. I'll start with uh, my questions for you to reflect on. You know, how much do you actually know about assessment and why assessment is so important to, to learning? What more would you like to know? Uh, what do you need to learn and how will you do this? One of the fundamental um, principles of assessment is that there are really two types of assessment. Um, formative assessment, which is an ongoing process um, and this is really a collaborative process with the learner. Um, formative assessment is, is used both to help the learner understand their, their needs and also to help the teacher reflect on the suitability of their materials and their, their approach to teaching. 
Um, sometimes formative assessment is also called assessment for learning. So assessment becomes formative when the evidence from this is used to adapt the teaching work to meet the needs of the learners. And it's not something that learners should be afraid of if it's done well. It should be something that they welcome uh, and that they should be involved in. We'll come back to formative assessment in a moment in a little bit more detail. I think the type of assessment that most teachers tend to think of when we talk about assessment is summative assessment. You know, the test at the end of the, the course or the end of the semester, um, what have you learned? Uh, this is the assessment that students are scared of, that they're afraid of, the, the national exam or the test. Um, so I think it's really important that you separate in your mind these two different types of assessment. Um, both are equally important, um, uh, but often it's the formative assessment, the ongoing assessment that, is, uh, uh, that lacks focus by teachers in the classroom. So let's have a look in a little bit more detail at formative assessment or assessment for learning. Uh, remember that through formative assessment, learners should receive from you regular feedback meaningful feedback. Um, there's a three M's principle, if you like. If, if you are giving marks, these are, you know, you should make marks meaningful. Um, so sh they should be specific, um, timely, and future focused. So it's not just looking back at what you've learned, but it's also looking forward to what you need to learn and where your gaps are. It's really important that learners are actively involved in their learning assessment. Um, they participate in this. They reflect on their own skills and their own, um, their own strengths and weaknesses. So perhaps you know, it's very important to share with them the criteria that you're using to assess their learning so that they can self-evaluate. If students are struggling, of course, um, that might not only be uh, you know, their fault, it might also be your fault. You, know? you might need to adapt um, your approach and your materials based on the results of this assessment. But remember, good teaching is responsive. If all of your students are struggling um, to understand a concept or to learn something new, maybe you need to think about a different way of teaching that. Good teaching decisions are based on a broad evidence base. Um, so you need to collect as many different, um, uh, you need to be able to assess your, your students' work um, and be able to, to make you know, clear um, evidence-based decisions on, on the types of tasks and exercises that you use based on their progress. This assessment for learning or formative assessment, if it's done well, can really um, help motivate your students because they'll see a sense of progress in their language learning development. Um, lastly, in the green box, it says learners assess themselves and understand how to improve. Again, good feedback from you can then lead to action by learners. They know what they need to do in order to get better at listening, reading, writing, or speaking. You could also encourage your students to um, assess each other. Um, if you have a large group, maybe in a large group of students, you could put them into smaller groups or into pairs and get them to assess each other's work and give feedback. That's um, a, 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 something that is, is highly recommended and will also help them to critically evaluate themselves later. Some, also some fundamental principles really in getting started, whether you're assessing um, through synchronous sessions or asynchronous sessions. With any new kind of, uh, well, when you're assessing, you, before your lesson, before you set a task, you've got to do some planning and preparation at the beginning. You've got to think about what you want to assess. What is the objective of this lesson or this task? What do you hope your students will have learned by the end of it? So both during the lesson and for homework and other assignments, you need to really think carefully about what you are assessing. Also remember that you can include other non-traditional forms of assessment, um, such as participation. 
um, creativity or confidence. So you might have some weaker students who are not getting the top marks, but if they're very um, participative, if they are, or maybe they're, they're very confident, but they make mistakes, they can be rewarded for this. So it's not only about the best students. There are different ways of giving uh, positive feedback and incentives to your, to your learners. It's very important, obviously, for you to keep a record. I think digital tools now help you to keep that record uh, in a very efficient way. And this ongoing record will help you to see how your learners are progressing over time. It's not just a register of attendance, but a record of um, progress. This makes it much easier to plan your lessons and at the end of the term or the year to write a report for each learner because you'll have that record um, throughout the year um, to be able to, to refer back to. Obviously, you can start with a list of names um, for, of your students in the same order as your register. But next to that, as well as their attendance, you know, make comments on their progress in the different, um, different skill areas and some, some comments. I think it's very important that you get to know your students individually. Remember, start simple, assessing one or two um, aspects and making notes against each, each learner. You don't have to overcomplicate this. Over time, you can add more things that you maybe are, are looking for. I think in the next part of my talk, I really want to talk about some synchronous tips. So this is the online, like this webinar, where you manage, you have a good internet connection and you manage to get your students together. Again, I think as Finita and Pajati said, I wouldn't recommend having a one hour or a 90 minute uh, online lesson for many of you. It might only be a short bite-sized uh, session, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. But within those 10 or 15 minutes, there are many things that you can do to both teach your students and give feedback. Um, so one of the things which we talk about is, is encouraging your students well, to, to tell you how they're, how they're doing, um, noticing. Um, you need to be able to notice who is doing well and who needs more support. Um, what areas need review um, if, if things haven't been learned? And what things has everybody mastered? Um, and there are some quick ways of doing this. If everybody's um, online, simply a thumbs up, whether it's an emoji or if, if like me, a physical thumbs up or a thumbs down, that could be a quick way of, of giving some feedback. Um, some teachers use this traffic light system where you can have a sort of a green, I totally understand, a yellow, I partly understand, but I'm not sure, or maybe a red, I, uh, I really am confused and I don't understand. Um, instead of using traffic lights or colors, you could use emojis to express your understanding. Um, maybe you could put emojis right now in the comments if, if, you're, if you're following this, if you totally understand. It, maybe your students uh, are fortunate enough to have a, a mini whiteboard or, um, that they could write on and hold up to the screen. If they don't have a whiteboard, they could simply write something on paper and hold this up to the screen. You could make use, if you're quite advanced, in getting your students to use the kind of chat function to talk to you, to give feedback and send answers. Um, they might also be able to, you might also be able to put your students into smaller groups and get them to chat to each other. These are all things that you could do online in a synchronous session. Self-checking is very important. Um, I think Encouraging your students to be a little bit more autonomous, um, giving them the responsibility to check their own answers against the key, for example, and report back to you on the answers that they need more clarification on. Instead of going over every answer individually as a group, you know, as a teach, you know, very teacher-centered focused. Um, so really building learner autonomy. Sometimes give them the key, give them the answer sheet and get them to check their own learning. Another tip you might, a, a way of giving feedback quickly is you might project or display through PowerPoint um, the answers to a task, 
but maybe one of those answers is wrong um, and ask your students to to tell you which answer is is wrong this is a way to focus on what the learners need rather than spending time on what learners already know again peer assessment if you're able to i encourage you to get your students to work together and to assess each other's work using peers means that the pressure is taken off individuals can do statements um, are very important as well what we mean by can do statements is by the end of this week or by the end of this course or by the end of this lesson um, what are students now able to do um, i often like to talk about the use of english to do something so functional language um, and i think maybe spending some time at the end of a, the lesson um, or the end of the week and asking students to write their own can-do statements or based on what they've learned is useful to you, for you to see their progress and also motivating for them to be able to know what they have learned. Um, obviously, one of the things that we're all learning at the moment and Finita highlighted just now is if you are able to use the internet and technology, you can make use of many free tools um, to create online quizzes and polls, uh, which can be a very fun way of engaging with your students and also a very useful way of checking learning and to see who is doing well, um, who, is, who has understood your lesson and who is getting the answers wrong. Um, so these kind of online polls and quizzes, almost it's a kind of gamification of learning. Um, often students find it fun, challenging, maybe they can compete against each other and get to the top of the leaderboard. But for you, um, this is really feedback, um, you know, that you can use and put into your report, into your register to monitor their progress. So it's a fun tool, but it's a very practical and, and useful tool for, for monitoring and assessing your students' progress. The last thing before I give you some resources, um, I don't have words uh, or detailed slides, but I really just want to focus on this, this for a moment, because I actually, I think this asynchronous learning and assessment is what is happening most of the time at, you know, in Indonesia uh, and in most countries around the world. I don't think many teachers um, have the, and certainly not all teachers, have the tools or the internet connection to run a synchronous session like we are right now. And if they do, it's often quite short. So what I strongly suggest to all of you is during these COVID-19 times is to focus on asynchronous learning. So what it means by asynchronous learning is that your learners are going to be autonomous. They're going to go away and do some self-directed learning in their own time. Um, I think it's very important that you give them a clear task, a mission. Um, you might spend 10 or 15 minutes, whether you are just giving them that task uh, via WhatsApp or by email or by you know, through a short um, Zoom session like this. Once you give those learners that task, um, they go off and then they will complete that task in their own time, um, maybe individually or in pairs or small groups. So if, it's, if they're doing that in their own time, this is asynchronous, you know, it's not at the same time, but that's okay. You've got to have confidence and put, give trust to your students uh, to get on and to complete that, that mini mission or activity that you've set them. It could be creating a short video or writing an essay, or, or completing a worksheet. Um, you, know, the, you can be very creative in the types of tasks that you set them. But right now, I think that this is um, how most teachers and most learners are continuing to, to work at home um, during these times. Now, once they've done that task, the next bit is they're gonna send it back to you and you're going to have to give feedback um, on how well they've done and what they need to do to improve. 
Um, but that analysis that you will do of, of their of their task that's submitted is very useful for you to be able to see how well they're doing uh, and what, what learning needs they have. So really, at the moment, I would focus on asynchronous learning primarily um, and synchronous learning, obviously, if you have the tools and everybody has um, access to the internet. Let me finish, I'm aware of time, uh, by giving you some recommendations to learn more about uh, both synchronous and asynchronous assessment and to continue your, your own professional development. So here are some resources and also some conferences and workshops coming up. Some of the tips that I've given you today, I've taken these from a British Council uh, website called Teaching English. Um, you can see the address here uh, at the top. And if you go to this website, you'll be able to download, you can see there's a PDF worksheet. Uh, it's just two pages. And these are, um, these, this, these, this PDF covers um, assessing learners online and the importance of a clear assessment criteria. Um, there are many different resources like this on the Teaching English website. Another one that will be of interest to you today um, is a summary of, again, some of these online quizzes um, and tips for noticing and getting your students to, to self-check their progress. So again, you've got the, the uh, address there and I will share my slides with you at the end of this talk. So don't worry about writing it down, you'll get a copy of my slides. Um, it's not just the British Council, there are many excellent um, so that different organizations and, and publishers who write books on English language teaching that are providing really good uh, webinars uh, at the moment during COVID-19. I'm sure if you're joining our webinar, you might have joined some others. This was a webinar, a very recent one by Cambridge University Press and Cambridge Assessment English. And this is a 50 minute webinar all about assessment for learning. And uh, so I highly recommend this one particularly, but also there are many others. There are some excellent um, uh, different blogs and articles about formative and uh, summative assessment, especially during COVID-19 and, and, and doing these things online. So I've, I wanted to highlight a couple of these for you to read in your own time. This one is called Seven Smart Fast Ways to Do Formative Assessment. Another one that I found very useful, uh, this, this article was called 11 Assessment Tools, 11 Useful Formative Assessment Tools for Teachers. So again, it, it's giving you some, some tools. So whilst you have tools that are good for uh, quizzes and keeping your, your lessons fun and engaging, there are some very useful tools um, technology uh, and uh, apps that are very useful for you to help you with your formative assessment. This, uh, there are two, two blogs by <clears throat> a website uh, that I've come across called Edutopia. So the first one is called Formative Assessment in Distance Learning. And the second one is, again, more tools, fantastic, fast, formative assessment tools. So they have uh, rounded up a variety of digital tools that you can explore and familiarize yourself to be able to use to, to monitor the progress of your students. Um, the British Council regularly runs different training online. We have our own webinars and we also have what is called a MOOC, a massive open online course. So this MOOC is called Language Assessment in the Classroom and it's about a one month course. And you have to do two hours of learning every week. Um, you can see it's, it says four weeks long. Oh, three hours of weekly study. And at the end of that course, you can get a certificate. Um, you can enroll right now, uh, although it's not running at the moment, but when it is running uh, in the future, you'll get an email and you'll be invited to join. And it's free, it's free to join. 
The British Council and Teflon, we're very, uh, we might mention this at the end of the, web, the webinar today, but as well as today's special webinar with Central Java, we're very proud that we're working closely together with Teflin on English language assessment in Indonesia. And we will be running a series of webinars specifically focused on assessment throughout October. So there will be four webinars uh, for you to come and join. And you'll be hearing from uh, both UK and Indonesian experts on assessment. Um, so if you're really interested in this topic, I encourage you to register and to come and join us for that. And at the end of October, the British Council is also running a, a two-day language assessment conference called New Directions in English Language Assessment. Um, and that is also now open to register uh, for free. The plan was to do this conference face-to-face -face in Singapore, but because of the pandemic, we've moved it online. And before the conference itself, we will run six different pre-conference events um, in October, which are also all free for you to join if you would like to, to develop your skills and knowledge in this area. Lastly, I haven't had time today to talk about the importance of proficiency, in measuring your English language proficiency, a little bit more on summative um, assessment but obviously it's very important that you know both your own level of English and your students know their level of English and if you're giving them 80 out of 100 or 70 out of 100 what does that mean is it meaningful um, so this is an area for another another day but I think if you don't know about the common European framework um, references of languages the CEFR um, this A2 to C2, um, you know, um, levels of English. What does it mean to be a B1 uh, language learner or a B2? Um, then I encourage you, that's your homework from me, is to find out more about the CEFR. And when you are measuring your students' level of English and giving them marks, what do those marks mean? Um, We've just launched a new free test called English Score, which you can use on uh, your phone, um, yourself or with your students. And this will give you a, a, a quick test and some feedback on your current English language proficiency. We don't have time to go into to that area in, in so much detail today, but through the assessment symposium and the conference, um, you certainly will hear a lot more about that. Thank you very much for your staying with me. Um, I'm apologize if I've gone over a little bit with my talk. Again, good luck uh, with your teaching and your professional development. Stay safe and keep in touch. Thank you very much. That's all from me. Well, thank you very much, Colm, for sharing the ELT Emergency Synchronous Learning and Assessment. It's really, really interesting. Well, ladies and gentlemen, kindly remind you uh, for questions, you could leave them on the chat box on YouTube by mentioning your name, organization, and the city first. And then uh, don't forget to write to whom your question is addressed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now we are coming to the last speaker for today, Mr. Aslam Khan. He will be sharing the new normal in 21st century English language education, linking theories and pedagogical practices in challenging time. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Aslam. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Clearly. Yes, can you see I can the screen? hear. Can yes, you see the clear. screen? Yes, we can see the screen too. Okay, uh, assalamualaikum and a very good uh, morning from Malaysia. Uh, I'm Aslam Khan from Malaysia and I'm not uh, really new to Indonesia. I've been around in Indonesia for the past 12 years and so much so that they call me Pak Aslam or Bapak Aslam. 
Thank you to Teflin and also British Council for inviting me to share uh, my thoughts and uh, my ideas about the new normal and where we look at theories and pedagogical uh, practices in challenging times. Well, uh, I don't have much time. I only have a max of uh, 20 minutes. Let me go through it and share with you and see uh, you know, how much we can talk later. All right. Okay. Now, one aspect of education doesn't change. And all of us know that education needs to shift from teaching us facts to teaching us how to live extraordinary lives. Now, this, this uh, code is very crucial now. Is truly crucial now because we are looking at living extraordinary lives. All right, let's shift our mindset about how we were and how we are now. And we all know in IR 4.0, the fourth in Re uh, industrial revolution, and there is an emphasis on use of cyber, cyber physical systems. All right, now you see there's a move. Okay, there's a shift. Okay, now I'm taking you through the journey of the theories and how uh, things have moved forward and changes have happened and see how we are in the new normal, yeah? And then we were brought into education 4.0. Now, what is Education 4.0? Now, Peter Fisk clearly mentioned what Education 4.0 is. Now, before the pandemic, we were already in Education 4.0. If we really analyze and evaluate, we can see that the new normal and Education 4.0 there are similarities. Look at the nine trends there. In education 4.0, we are already anywhere, anytime, teaching and learning. Personalized, very flexible in our delivery. Peers and mentors is why and where. Practical application not modular and projects, student ownership, evaluated, not examined. So evaluation is more crucial than examination, yeah? So let's go through. The conventions. Now this is the convention. Look at the convention. If we look at the convention, we find that there's no social distancing. It was all a very closely knitted family learning and teaching. But we are now into the pandemic situation. And when we get into our new pandemic uh, situation, the new normal, so-called the new normal, we are looking at the challenges. We are looking at realism versus idealism. Whether we are going for truly the ideal ways of teaching or learning, or we are looking at the reality of learning and teaching. And then we are all over the world. All over the world, we are facing the same situation. And what stands or what kind of perspective are we taking? Will it be the same in Indonesia or Malaysia or Japan or Korea? So these are some of the thinking questions 
that we really need to uh, reflect and bring into our classroom because we are teachers in our own context. Some of the things that others are doing may not be workable in our classroom. So as a teacher or as a practitioner, we have to reflect a lot when we are in our own classroom. Okay, let's move on. The new normal. This is what it is said about the new normal, a previously unfamiliar or atypical situation that has become standard, usual, or expected. Now, when I shared the Education 4.0, it was something that was not familiar much earlier. But in Education 4.0, the nine trends has already been practiced, put into practice, realized, and has become a standard. So I'm not sure because I keep on thinking, is the new, the pandemic, something new, or the pen, we are back to education 4.0, the nine trends, which we have put into practice. So is the new normal really a new normal? These are questions for us to think about. And when we talk about new normal, uh, these are the keywords. Keywords that we look at when we talk about the new normal. And the shift, we talk about the shift. Convention to very... If we look at this slide, we are looking at individualized and personalized differentiated learning, which is away from the convention. So in Education 4.0, this is one of the trends. Technology. So we are looking at the shift, the shift, the seven most powerful idea we are talking about shifts in learning today. Physical to digital, standards to habits, compliance to play, schools to communities, reaction to interaction, isolation to connectivism, privacy to transparency. Now, I'm always looking at all this in the context of the Education 4.0, 21st century uh, learning and teaching, and also IR 4.0. So these were all before the pandemic. So what are our thoughts or your thoughts? And when we come to testing and evaluation, the convention, the convention. In the new normal, we move a solution where we go into all these, uh, you know, digital aspects of assessment, remote, AI driven, fraud prevention, so when you're taking an examination online, the AI-driven fraud prevention technology will check on you whether you are really taking the test. So, if we look at all this and we are moving into the new normal, so-called new normal in education, the transitioning is something that lots of us have to face 
these are the challenges and we have to come up with our own best practices. Education 4.0 was initiated much earlier before the pandemic, but were changes made. But now, due to the circumstances, we are forced to. So these are some of the thoughts that all of us as practitioners should be looking at. And we talk about unlearning. We know about roles of deaths, heavy backs, exam. And now we have to unlearn all those because in the new normal, it is not about roles of deaths, heavy backs, mass lectures, public exams, broken parent teacher communication. So these are some of the changes that we have to establish. But in the education 4.0, we were, we were, in, when we were introduced to education 4.0, we were basically suggested to all these changes. And now in the pandemic situation, we face challenges and we are putting all this into practice. And these are some of the strategies or some of the ideas that are put forward when we are in this situation. Empower, activate students to lead their own learning. Now that's the new normal. But it's also in education 4.0. It's also in 21st century education. Keep it real. It is a learning experience. Whenever students are taught, they can put it into practice. So it's a learning experience. Contextualized. This is the biggest word that personally, I think, should be the key in all learning and teaching. Contextualize according to the needs of your learners. If you are teaching in Samarang, you contextualize it according to the needs of your learners in Samarang. Because Samarang can be different from Palembang. Palembang can be different from Malang. Malang can be different from Jakarta. Reach. Extend learning beyond the school. Remember in Education 4.0, they say community learning. So learning now is not basically only the student and the teacher. It is the community. Well, inspire. I think teachers are the greatest source of inspiration for all students in their classes. Wire. Now, we always say, no technology, we cannot function effectively. No. Technology is your servant. Technology is not the master. It's just a means. It's not the end to everything. And these are some of the tips for teachers. If you look at the seven tips for teachers, Practice, practice, practice. Communicate with students. Be optimistic. Make a routine. Assign work that matters. Create a sense of community. Show availability. All right. I have two or three more minutes. Let me move on. And the shift. We are talking about a shift. The convention to the new normal. A pedagogical implication. Now, please personalize your pedagogical shift. Teaching and learning is not one size fits all. Remember that. 
one size doesn't fit all. You have to personalize your pedagogical shift according to the needs of your learners. So to ease the transition, the shift of learning space, shift of delivery, shift in learning evaluations, shift of responsibility in the teaching and learning process. Look at all this shift. This is something for us to really reflect and put into practice. This is a practical approach that I personally created. This is something that I created. And I feel that uh, whenever I create something like a teaching a poem, he has such quiet eyes by the poet from uh, Jakarta. I give the instruction procedure activities and I find that it is very new normal. It's very new normal. It's synchronous and asynchronous. And then I have the principles and beliefs and I have the outcome and remarks. So I am very happy because I have realized the teaching and learning of English language based on the required principles, beliefs. And the conclusion. New kind of problem requires new methods of solution and new methods of solutions require new way of thinking for quality and effective learning and teaching. So please context, use the word contextualized. So anything you say, I've contextualized my learning and teaching to the needs of my learners, to where I am based. So are we into the new normal? Now, these are the 10 pertinent questions for all of us to reflect. And if we can reflect and provide a good answer to all this, then, ladies and gentlemen, we are the teachers of the new normal. And my hope is that our new normal today exposes what was wrong with our old normal yesterday and set us up for a better normal tomorrow. Thank you very much. I think I kept to the time. And once again, thank you so much, Teflin and Hotel British Council. My sharing session is for us to reflect and then put into practice according to the needs of where we are serving. So, for all the Indonesian teachers, do your best for all the children of Indonesia because they are the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Aslam Khan, for the enlightening sharing, especially on the new normal assessment and evaluation, a way more challenging in this hard time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've been enjoying uh, all sessions so far. We are now moving to the question and answer sessions. So the first question comes from Sutrisno uh, from Untirta Serang. I think this question is addressed to all speakers how to overcome the problem like the lack of bone in bone feeling in e-learning. So maybe starting from Pak Jati. You are still mute, Pak. Okay, okay. Um, so can you repeat the questions, Ibu Pasca? Sorry, how I will. To, yeah, how to overcome the problem like the lack of in uh, born in born feeling in e-learning i think it's for motivation um it's very difficult uh, questions to respond on that um it's always uh, giving the motivation and boring and uh, feeling bored uh, and so on and so on but the key is uh, again bite size um keep it short uh, this ability uh, feeling with friends like using uh, using uh, 
padlet using board mm -hmm. because usually when uh, it's one to one it's like the teacher with the laptop only with one student and the student is only talking to teachers there is no feeling of social so to build up a feeling of social um, environment in in the online it's not easy like mm. if, if you're luxury you can have zoom and you can have the uh, breakout room but that's uh, complicated um, but very easily you can use padlet you can use uh, learning apps uh, there is a, some tools there that you can explore on that maybe finita uh, got a better idea for young learners yes finn uh, okay um I think what it means by born in born feeling is the kind of uh, uh, giving the teachers presence in the online learning because I believe that students feel isolated, they feel lonely, and teachers also feel isolated and lonely at the same time. What I can suggest is first we can give our students, if we are not using Zoom, you can give your students a short video uh, using screen Castify that I uh, suggested on my presentation. Or if it is impossible, uh, I get the, I, this idea from Pak Farm actually, you can start using emoticon, emoji. In the morning when you start your class uh, in Telegram or in WhatsApp, for example, start by uh, asking the students to give uh, the emoji expressing their feeling at that time. And then they can write the happy emoji, sad emoji, angry emoji, things like that. It shows that we have empathy to our students. We are not only, as a teacher, we are not only there to give instruction, giving tasks, but also we also provide, we show that we feel what you feel. Let's, let's share our feeling together. That's what I can say. Over to you, Mbak Pasca. Okay, so maybe Bu Isi want to add something? Well, uh, I think it depends on the level of education. I think uh, to some extent, the level of education also, uh, plays roles in what is interesting to the students. For example, in my case, when I have to teach uh, the university students, I think uh, discussion is more interesting, uh, synchronous uh, meeting with teleconference is more interesting. And also, uh, I think when I, uh, I ask simple questions like, how are you? And giving them good wishes, like, I hope you are still healthy today during the pandemics and please take care of yourself, uh, stay distant and so on. If I say that, I, I got a lot of uh, positive response because they feel that uh, we care about their health. Uh, and I think with the younger uh, school students, uh, as Bufinita said, uh, it would be different because we, 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 like, uh, we have to show emotion uh, with emoji, with, you know, maybe we, we also uh, motivate them with songs and so on. I think uh, it, it would all depends on the level of uh, age of the students. Uh, I think that also affects how we should treat them for motivation. All right, so Kom, would you like to uh, have something to say? Um, I think I would just say that this is something that is very new for most teachers and students, certainly in Indonesia, that don't worry about trying to be an expert overnight. It's going to take time. Um, as you learn, you know, more tools that you can use and you feel comfortable with. Um, so keep things very simple. Um, I think what the other speakers have just said now about um, during these times, it's not just about your role as a, as a teacher is also, you know, it's, it's kind of being a supportive um, figure to those learners, to reassure them, to keep in touch, um, to encourage them and, and, and motivate them um, through these sort of very difficult times. I would say my kind of couple of tips would be one is obviously there are lots of resources now like um good webinars by the british council by cambridge by by itel and pat jatty there are lots of things that you can watch um to develop your knowledge and then try out one or two of these tools that are you know that appeal to you um, and practice with them and the second kind of tip I would say is that 
I think it's important for you to talk to and engage with the parents of your learners because the parents um, pay, play a very key role at the moment. Um, they're at home, they're often supervising their children um, through homeschooling. So parents need also to be made aware of uh, what their learners are doing and what you want those learners to do um, so that the parents can support them where needed. It might be technical support, um, it might be a little bit of support with the lesson. Um, so communicate with the parents. Um, and maybe my last tip would be, and I've, I've mentioned this once or twice before, be very clear with your learners about when you're going to communicate with them, like when you're on and when you're off and try to keep to a strict timetable. I think in schools, you have a very clear timetable for your lessons. Um, and I think it's important to have that kind of systematic approach with your students, even though they're at home. It, if you don't have these boundaries, you'll be getting WhatsApp messages or emails from parents and students, you know, 24 hours a day, and you'll become exhausted and you can't manage that. So I think you need to think about when is the time that you're going to um, meet your students and maybe give them a task and then they go off and they work on that in their own time. And then when is the time that you're going to give feedback to them? Um, you know, so I think planning will help all of this, but being systematic and clear about the objectives of your tasks of the, the lesson and the timing um, for it are, are very important kind of fundamental um, aspects of emergency remote teaching and assessment. All right, great answer. So, Baslan, would you like to have something to add? I think when we talk about uh, assessment and teaching, like what I always, uh, because I am uh, one person who really advocate contextualization. So I am the contextualization person in uh, education. So therefore, uh, as teachers, I think we, we don't really need to have a standard kind of uh, you know, teaching and learning, uh, assessment or whatever, because uh, it's evaluation. It's evaluation we are looking at because examination and assessment and, you know, I, I'm not to say I'm against, but I think whatever we evaluate is based on what we have taught because the outcome of what we are teaching is so crucial because we have at the back of our head before we enter the class, today I want to achieve this outcome. And that's it. If we have done that, inshallah, we have taught the learners and the taught learners have learned. And when we evaluate them, we are evaluating them on the outcome that we have set earlier. So that's what teaching and learning is all about. We share with them and then we evaluate them what they have learned and we take another step from, from what we have done. So teachers, don't feel that you have a gun at your forehead to be shot at all time, what you're doing right or wrong. Give your best in the best possible situation with the best facilities and the best technology or whatever you have, resources you have. The bottom line is, have you achieved your outcome that you set? before you enter the class. If you have, your conscience is clear. Inshallah, you have been that teacher. That's what I, I, I feel, yeah. All right, thank you, uh, Pa Aslam. So now we're moving to the next question. So the question comes from uh, Damayanti Lazuardi Kamila Solo. And this question is addressed to uh, Bapak Jati and Ibu Finita. Can you suggest what skill do we have to develop for students in elementary during this pandemic? Is it a speaking, reading, or a writing? So I think like the priority one. Okay, please, Ibu Finita and Pajati. Um, I will not uh, suggest any, uh, sorry. Uh, I will not suggest any skills to develop, but I suggest more on exposure. This is elementary school, so exposure of books, it's at home with the help of the parents possibly. 
uh, exposure of a YouTube channel for kids uh, so that they enjoy rather than a traditional teacher in emergency remote teaching trying very hard to give something to elementary school children at home, I think that's uh, going to be very difficult. So my suggestion is uh, less uh, good stories, less good books, uh, share with the parents and um, get the exposure. I think that's the great moment right now to give the kid exposure to English. Could be in a writing, could be in a listening, whatever, but not in a quotation, not teaching. So exposure for elementary school, I think it's the best. Finn? Yes, but, um, yeah, supporting you. Uh, I believe that the idea of teaching English for young learners, not only during the pandemic, but also teaching English for young learners in general, is not to develop any language skills, but it's to develop the students' uh, interest and love to learn uh, language other than their uh, mother tongue. So uh, we need exposure for the students. Uh, you can also try accessing uh, British Council website, learning these kids. You can find so many songs, stories, uh, flashcard games that can engage the students uh, during the online learning. And then uh, in regards to the, the responses from students, it doesn't, it's, it's not necessarily skills like speaking or writing when they can point to something, they can identify um, a word, they can circle on the words, that should be uh, enough for young learners. So they do, you don't need to expect them to be able to write or speak or make a speech uh, by circle on something, point to something, um, uh, categorizing something, that should be enough. That's all, Mbak Pastia. All right, interesting point, Ibu Vinita and Pak Jati. Now we're moving to the next question. The question is from uh, Roshida uh, from SMK Logosari Semarang. So the question is addressed to Mr. Downs. How should the online assessment be done in this pandemic era in relation to uh, the validity? Please come. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I've been looking at some of the questions and I'm gonna try to respond to a few of those. Um, I've been looking at questions from Andreas and Sutrisno and Astuti as well, um, but that's a, a really important question. It's around validity and how to do this kind of online assessment. Um, one thing I would, so let's, let's sort of start with, and also it kind of goes back to what Prof Islam was saying about making things meaningful and motivating. Um, I want to highlight one thing in particular. I think there is a huge advantage at the moment. I mean, there are lots of disadvantages from the current situation. But one of the advantages for me is that by moving to more asynchronous tasks, personalized asynchronous tasks, where maybe you're asking your students to write um, an essay in their own time, or a short text, or to make a video, maybe a one minute video, and send that video to you by WhatsApp, you're going to get a lot of, um, you know, these are the productive skills. And I often think that in class, you don't, if you especially have, if you have a lot of students, only the strongest students tend to speak, or, you know, maybe you only share, you know, the best written example from one student who writes on the board. But if everybody right now is at home, maybe they're on their own, and they all have the same individual personalized task, they will all have to produce, um, you know, productive skills, a response to that task. Um, and that can be very motivating for them. Um, it's again, it's great for you for doing formative assessment of each individual learner. It's gonna take time, sure, but it's, you know, it's a rich um, um, sort of, the, the, whatever that your students produce will be very rich for you uh, to analyze in order to, to gain kind of a better understanding of how they're doing and their, their English language skills. So specifically on writing and speaking, I recommend again, giving your students clear tasks to get on with and then send those to you, uh, whether it's by WhatsApp or by email. Um, and if it's an individual response, 
you know, they can't cheat. They, you know, if they're making a video, it's only them. If they're writing a text, they might have some help writing that text. But if it's about them, then uh, you know, it will be an individual response. Going back to just the other point around maybe reading and listening, I think one of the things that you can do in that area, um, obviously, I know a lot of teachers here use worksheets. There'll be multiple choice questions. Um, how do you know that it's your learner who's who's answering that, or are they getting help, or are they are they cheating? It will be. I acknowledge it will be hard to tell, but if you can do a synchronous online game or quiz like using Quizlet or Kahoot, um, that's going to be fun. And I think it's a race against time. It's you know there's a, often a clock. And so the students who respond quickest um, will get to the top of the leaderboard. So it will be a fun way of doing a test and it will show you who's, who's answering those questions fastest. I think, it's, you know, reflect on this and think about um, um, both the, the kind of benefits and the challenges to overcome of, of, of online assessment during these, these challenging times. But there are definitely, for me, um, lots of advantages that we uh, we should be thinking about and celebrating. All right, good point, Com. Like clear task to the students. So now we're we're moving to the next question uh, from Kusnan uh, SM Adar Mawanita One Gedangan. So I think this is for everybody. Like how to teach online effectively in order to make the students get the knowledge as well as making them still in good character, like the character building one. OK, so who want to start? Sir? Yes, Pajati. OK, uh, that's uh, often us, uh, how to teach online effectively. Um, it's about online. Harus dibedakan ya. It's online and emergency remote teaching. That's two different things. If you're going to have an effective online class, not emergency remote teaching, then you need a full support from the university or your school. You need full support of equipment. You need full support of teacher training and so on and so on, so that you can have a effective online delivery. Itu, itu kuncinya. Everything should be prepared. Everything should be uh, sliced and uh, ready, like uh, some schools have done that, yeah, but not many. Gitu. But if you're asking, how about emergency remote teaching to be effective? I cannot answer that. Okay, back to you, uh, Ibu Pasca. All right, maybe call. Just to add on to what Pat Jatsi said, obviously you need the tools um, to be effective. You need a strong internet connection. Your students and yourself need the the laptop or the phones. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the kind of tools. But really, when we talk about effective teaching, it's, it's about good pedagogy. And it doesn't matter whether you're in the classroom or whether your students are at home. Good pedagogy applies, you know, um, whatever the, 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 the kind of, whether it's remote teaching or face-to-face or -face teaching, the, the principles of good pedagogy should still be there. Um, technology is just a tool in order for you to reach your students. So when you're planning your lesson and thinking about the objectives of that lesson and what you hope your students will have learnt, um, that's the same, whether you're going to be uh, in the classroom or, or trying to do this online. So just bear in mind that technology is just a tool in order for you to reach your students. But it, it has some advantages as well because of the apps um, that we can use with our learners. Yes, great point, Kong and Bajati. Well, ladies and gentlemen, due to the short time we have, uh, unfortunately, this is the end of question and answer session. Thank you very much, Ibu Isi, Bapak Jati, Ibu Finita, Mr. Kong and Mr. Aslam. The discussion has been really, really fruitful and enlightening for everybody coming to this webinar today. So, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the end of the webinar. Kindly remind you to complete the evaluation form uh, before 1 p.m. Western Indonesia time. 
to get the link to download your e certificates and materials. You, so you can see the link on the screen. Only those who complete the survey before 1 p.m. will be recorded on the attendance list. Before I close, let me give a chance to our speaker to give a brief closing statement to the great teachers of Indonesia, starting from Ibu Isi, please. Well, I think uh, the baby boomer teachers are ready to adapt with this pandemic situation. We just need more time and perseverance, and we also need patience on the side of the learners. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Isi. So we move to Pajati, please. Yes, I'm the baby boomer here. <laughs> One of the baby boomers, actually. Okay, um, emergency remote teaching is not the same with online learning or online teaching. Keep that in mind. So in the emergency remote teaching right now, we need the ability to transform our lecturing or our teaching into a series of bite-sized activities. Yeah, so we should be able or learn or try hard to transform our lecturing or our teaching materials into a serious bite size of activities. Back to you, Bu Pasca. Thank you, Bajati. So we move to Ibu Finita, please. Uh, thank you, Bu Pasca. Um, in designing uh, emergency remote teaching activities, what we need to keep in mind is Kiss. Keep it simple and short. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Kong? Um, uh, my closing comment would be just, I've seen so much creativity from teachers over the last couple of months responding to this crisis. And I'm hugely impressed by the dedication of Indonesian teachers to continue the education for their students. So I want to sort of congratulate you on your efforts. But also, I think you need to think about the future, that when this pandemic ends, and it will end, things won't be the same. Um, yes, you will go back to the classroom, but it's clear, and most people now recognize that the use of technology is going to be here to stay. I think there will always be face-to-face -face, uh, teaching and schools, and that is the primary place for learning. But in addition to that, these tools, um, the way that we can communicate with students um, through remote uh, learning um, is here to stay. So the more you do now, the more you develop your skills, the more you'll be preparing um, yourself for what will be the future. You will all need to be what we call a blended or hybrid English teacher in the future. And I think that's a, go a good thing. So whatever efforts you're putting in now, it's not just for a few months, it's gonna be forever. Thank you. And Mr. Aslan, please. Mr. Aslan? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what I want to say is that a quick one, I think I agree with all the speakers that uh, there's a difference between online uh, teaching and learning and remote learning. There are two different things for us to understand. And also the uh, synchronous and asynchronous. I mean, some of these terms that we need to know as uh, English teachers. And uh, you have lots of resources, but all these resources needs to be contextualized pedagogically according to the needs of your learners, yeah? So like I say, it doesn't mean that one, one hat fits all. I think uh, contextualize it and uh, uh, always remember that uh, you are never alone. Cikgu, cikgu, or teachers, you never walk alone. We always work, walk together. So please, uh, you know, work together as a community, uh, as a, uh, you know, the fraternity of uh, English language teaching and learning so that we all move together. And if you need support, please seek. We are always there to assist because we are also learning. And since it's for Indonesia, uh, saya berasa senang hati sekali karena dapat uh, berkongsi sedikit idea-idea ini dan semua guru-guru uh, pergilah ke semua sekolah di mana guru-guru uh, berada 
bagikan yang terbaik untuk membina bangsa dan negara Indonesia supaya anak-anak Indonesia akan jadi anak-anak yang luar biasa di platform dunia. InsyaAllah. Assalamualaikum dan uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you Mr. Aslam. Yeah, finally ladies and gentlemen, that's all for our webinar today. Hopefully you enjoy our webinar on challenges of EFL online learning during the COVID-19 pandemic. On behalf of Central Java Tevin, we would like to thank all the distinguished speakers and all participants for joining this webinar. And our gratitude also goes to British Council Indonesia for all the support. Thank you, Calm, and the teams in this webinar. You did a great job. Ladies and gentlemen, we also would like to remind you to stay safe and healthy and stay happy during the heartbreaking pandemic. We are now having all pan panelists on the screen. Let us have the photo session by looking at your camera. Uh, Jesse? All right. So I think, thank you very much, everybody. All the best for all great teachers of Indonesia. And I'll see you in another occasion. Goodbye.